Now imagine it's midnight, I know it's daytime in this video, I know, I know, just work with me here, do some imagining. Imagine it's midnight and you're knocking on your friend's door, and you really need some bread, you, you're really pretty persistent, you're knocking on the door there, you say, hello friend, and you say, uh, please may I have some bread for my family, my, my, my weans, my children, uh, you might get this response, uh, Chelsea might be angry with you for waking her up in the middle of the night, and she needs her beauty sleep, so understandable. But in the parable of the friend of midnight, Jesus says that actually probably that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that because of your persistence and audacity for waking your friend up right in the middle of the night, they're going to say yes, they're going to give you that bread that you need. Um, as you can see, yeah, Johnny's very persistent there, as you can see. And prayer is a bit like that too. So Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. That's what prayer's like. Ask and you will receive. Yeah, we, we spent all the budget on bread, sorry. Yeah, that's that's it. That's the end of the parable. Hello, good evening and welcome. So, yes, I'm going to do the talk for tonight. And we are now at the end of our series called Change Your Story. And we've been looking at the stories that we tell ourselves. They will determine our behaviours. And our behaviours will then produce certain results. And if we're not happy with the results that we're getting out of life, faith, how we're doing it, then we need to look at our behaviours and we need to change them. And if we want to change our behaviours, then we have to look up and out to what our kind of overarching narrative is. What is the grand story that we feel we're part of? And does that story need to change? So Philip kicked us off and he was talking about how the story that we tell ourselves about who God is and God's personality and God's character will actually determine behaviours that will make us less fruitful as Christians. And we looked at that parable of the talent, do you remember? And then Matt last week, he talked about money and how money actually will tell a story and how you use your money will either tell a story about your priorities and your life and this present reality, or the way you use your money can tell a story about God's reality, about God's kingdom, about God's economy and God's eternity, and that we're just here as for a short time as recipients of God's goodness and generosity, and we're really stewards of the things of God. We're just passing things on. So how we, or the stories that we tell about money are really important about uh, shaping the way that we live. So today I'm going to talk to you about prayer. And um, there's a story that we're going to look at, the parable of Jesus, where he gives this tale to his disciples. And it's to shape their story about prayer, to shape their behaviours, and to enable them to see better results. But when we think about prayer, um, some of you might get really excited. You might be the kind of people who, yeah, prayer is great in my life. I pray every day. I see so many like, answers to prayer. My prayer life is powerful. I see things of God happening, and it's completely satisfying and fulfilling. Yeah, prayer, I've really got it. And some of you here, you'll be thinking, actually, my prayer life is a massive disappointment. I've been praying to God for years over one issue and I haven't seen it resolved. I've seen no answer to that prayer at all and I'm at the point of, of giving up. And then there are some of you who you have an even more passive view of prayer and in your mind you think that God is sovereign, we can't change his will, God will do what God wants, therefore why should I pray? And if we ask that really pertinent question, why am I not praying? Often that is the story that is kind of influencing our life. I can't really change anything about the world I live in. I can't influence God. And that's a really passive view. It's a very passive story that we're telling about our role in prayer. Now, prayer. When Jesus taught about 
prayer, when he gave the story to the, to the disciples, it was just really interesting because they'd been hanging around him for a while. And they'd been watching him sneak off to quiet, solitary places and then come back full of the life of the Spirit. I just imagine, you know, they, they saw him go all empty and dry uh, after ministering to the crowds. And then they'd see him go off to pray. And then they would see him return and he would be absolutely transformed. And they would see that he was kind of radiant with the life of God. And then he'd go off and do more mission, more miracles. And they were beginning to put two and two together. The disciples were thinking, we want what you've got. We see that you are transformed when you go off and pray. And we think that it's the power source behind the miracles, the ministry that you've got. Jesus, will you teach us how to do what you're doing? So in this context... Uh, Jesus gives the disciples the, the Lord's Prayer, and then he gives them this parable. And he said, this is the story that I want you to think and be kind of conscious of when you think about prayer. And the story goes like this. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet... Because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. It's a funny little parable, isn't it? And we're thinking, what is the message that's being advocated? Are we supposed to be nuisance neighbours to our community? Is that what's being advocated there? What is it? And I think we need to, to unpack it because there's quite a lot of culturally specific elements in that story that we need to have a little look at. The first one is you've got this friend. Actually, we'll look at the characters. You've got these, these three people in this story. You've got, you've got the, the nuisance neighbour. You've got his friend who doesn't want to be disturbed, and you've got this traveller who's hungry and has arrived at the host looking for bread. Okay, these are these three characters. Now, the first thing that looks odd to us is you've got this friend who doesn't want to be disturbed, and the reason being he's in bed with his children. For us in our modern world, we're thinking, should we call the social services? Is there something wrong going on here? So this man doesn't want to be disturbed. He's got his children in bed with him. There's no sign of the wife, just the children. Um, now, this is actually quite normal for first century Judea. It's quite normal to have all the family in bed together. Not great for your marriage. I don't think my husband would advocate this kind of thing. So you don't really... <laughs> so you've got this man, all his family in bed together. This is normal in Judea. You have basically their, their houses... Uh, they had this living space, and everybody would live in that living space day and night. You would sleep there all together. And that you'd even bring in your, your cattle or your livestock under the house into this lower area, and they served as a, a bit like central heating, early century central heating system. The heat from the animals would rise. Not very nice to smell at night um, and a bit noisy, but once everyone was asleep, it would be lovely and calm, no disturbance, until the nuisance neighbour starts knocking. Now, the friend doesn't want to be disturbed. One of the reasons is he talks about his children. In the Greek, children means little children, tiny children. If you've ever had to put tiny children to bed, you know that once they've gone to bed, after hours of coaxing, reading stories, milk and biscuits, once they're in bed and once they're asleep, you don't want to disturb them. You want to keep everything quiet and still and undisturbed. If you wake the children up 
First of all, they get really excited and hyper when they're awake in the middle of the night, and they'll be running around making a noise. They'll wake up all the livestock. You've got cows mooing, you've got sheep going berserk, and you've got you know, goats, your cockerel starts, cock, you know, cockadoodle do whatever. But you've got a lot of noise. You've got major disruption happening in this scenario. This friend is quite within his rights to want to stop any disturbance, isn't he? Hands up, he's kind of rooting for the friend. I think, yeah. Why should he be disturbed? Thank you, Lucas. One person. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> a few. <laughs> so, you know, some of us will be rooting for the neighbor, uh, for the friend, thinking, yeah, that's outrageous. You get your life sorted out. You sort out your provisions. This is your problem to the nuisance neighbor. But the nuisance neighbor doesn't give up. And it says in this story, what Jesus advocates is that he is persistent. You imagine him nagging and nagging and banging and banging. Give me some bread. He's not going to go away until he gets the bread to feed the friend. He's not going to give up. He's not going to give up. Why? So uh, culturally specific element number two, we need to know that in Judea, hospitality was a big deal they place a really high value on hospitality. We don't really value it as much in this country, I don't think. So many times I've had people to my house, like Sophie and Hannah, I just give them a glass of water, no bread, they don't demand anything, there's not a national outcry. So we we don't really feel the same way about food and providing for a a traveller. But in Judea, this was a major public humiliation. If you don't have anything to offer your guest, and... The reason is that that guest is a traveller. You don't have public transport. You haven't got shops on the way. There's no food. There's miles of desert. And literally, your life depends on you finding your destination and knowing that that host will feed you. He's got an obligation to feed you because you're starving. You haven't eaten for days. So this is a major deal. You've got this starving traveller. You've got this man in this situation where he's going to face utter humiliation. And he gets to choose. He goes, right, I'm going to make a choice here. I either choose starvation, humiliation, or disturbance. And he decides he's going to disturb the guy. Who's rooting for the nuisance neighbor now? Who thinks, yeah, we, want, we think he's right, yeah. Not everybody. <laughs> no, let him starve. Let him be humiliated. Right, but he is not going to give up. He's banging on that door until finally he gets the bread. And that is a story over. Now, what is Jesus advocating here? It's not passivity. He is saying that prayer, the story that I'm presenting you about prayer, is that it's the opposite of passive. You need to be tenacious. You need to be persevering. You need to be shamelessly audacious. You've got to really go for it. This is the kind of prayer that God wants. This is the story that he creates for the disciples so that they know what behaviors Jesus is approving of. He said, you are going to go out. You're going to be tenacious. You're going to bang on doors. You're going to ask, ask, ask. You're not going to give up until you get the goods. Now, I think, this is my reading of this. I think this is, this is because Jesus is aware that for humanity, there's like two purposes for our lives. We've got this purpose, this destiny, which is not of God. It's actually, it's a demonic destiny. It's a destiny that is, is kind of presented to us as, as one of darkness and of despair, of shame, of humiliation, of lack. And if you look at this story... The, um, the traveller and the, the nuisance neighbour, they represent the possibility of this purpose for their lives, which is not of God. It's not God's will for their lives to be starving. It's not God's will for their lives to be in shame and in humiliation. And I think for humanity, this is the destiny that, that is offered to us in the world if we don't choose to do something about it. This is where passivity will lead us. And then you have this other destiny that is presented. And I think it's, it's presented by Jesus. It's presented by God the Father, the loving Father. And it says, 
This is the destiny I want for you. I want you out of shame. I want you shameless. You need to be courageous to walk in this destiny, but it will lead you out of poverty. It will lead you out of starvation. It will lead you out of shame. It will lead you out of humiliation. But if you want it, you have to go after it. It won't just fall on your lap. And I think this is the message about prayer, that there's something about it that demands us to act. If we want the things of God, we can't just expect God will just deliver it. There's a little bit of war, there's a little bit of battle going on down here. We have to be tenacious, bold, audacious. We have to be shameless. We have to run after it in our prayer life. Prayer has to be passionate. We have to be persevering in prayer. We've got to go for it. Why? Because at the center of this story that Jesus paints is a loving God who wants to give good gifts to his children. They are there for the asking. They don't automatically come. You have to pray them down. You have to pray them into your life. You have to pray them into existence. You have to work with God. So we've got this loving God. Do you know what God says in the Bible? Well, Jesus says it. He says, you ask for anything in my name and I will do it. That's a really, really big promise, isn't it? Anything. God says on so many occasions in the Bible, you need to pray and I will hear you. You pray and I will answer. You know, we've got a God who says you can pray for anything and I'll give it to you. It's there. Wow. We can pray. We can pray for anything. That means, my goodness, we need to be careful about what we pray for. We need to be careful, don't we? Because God is listening and God will answer. But God is there ready to listen, ready to pour out answers to prayer because he has got this destiny for our lives. He's got this purpose for us, which is to radiate his glory and shine for the kingdom, not live in darkness, shame, starvation and in want. That's not what he wants for us. He wants us to shine. There's a scripture that says he wants to shine like jewels in a crown. We're going to shine for God because we're reaching out in prayer, asking, asking, not giving up. Now I've got a story about shining because I like to shine. I'm a bit of a, a showman, showwoman. I do like the stage. I can't help myself. I come from a family of performers my dad's a trumpet player, my mum's an opera singer. I think, somebody asked me today, I think it was Maisie, do you get nervous going on the stage? And actually, I think there's something not quite right with me, because I don't. It's almost like, I don't know, this, most people get a little bit of fear, don't they? But there's something missing. So no is the answer to that. But I do like, I do, I do like to shine in front of people. I feel like, you know, this is something I'm made for. Anyway, I was once a student at Bath Spa University. I was not a very good student. I was a PGCE primary years student, and I just felt like an imposter. I wasn't as talented as the rest of my cohort. You know, when we went in on our placements, they were amazing, and I was the one making all the children cry because I was treading on their fingers as I was walking around. <laughs> and they would hand me a poo, and I would just throw it at them, thinking, why have you given me a poo? And my co-op would just take it and make a paper mache castle out of it. And I was thinking, I'm not quite in the league of these women. They just, they just tuned in. So I really respect primary school teachers. You just have incredible skill and talent. But most of the time when I was doing this course, I felt very talentless. I felt you know, that I, I, I'm not really, it affected my self-esteem after all. I thought, you know, I, I can't really do this as well as everyone else. And I felt a bit low about myself. But I saw on our timetable that at the end of the year, there will be these two weeks where we were going to do like a music week. And I thought, oh my goodness, we're going to do like a whole week of playing musical instruments. Finally, I get my chance to shine. I can show everybody that I'm not a useless piece of you know, flesh in the room. I'm, I'm actually, I'm worth something. I've got talents. I can give. I can contribute in some way. I thought, that's going to be my moment. Kate, don't worry. It's coming up soon. You're going to shine. Anyway, the week comes. We arrive at university the first day. We're making uh, musical instruments out of junk. I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is a bit beneath me, but never mind. So I had a butter dish, <laughs> elastic band. I spent the whole day just pinging 
at my butter dish thinking, I hope it gets better than this. It didn't get better than this. The whole day I thought, oh my goodness, I cannot bear this. I cannot bear this. I've got so much to offer. I've got so many gifts and talents and I'm just not being used. So on the second day, I went up to my lecturer and I said, I'm just very sorry to disturb you. In fact, no, I'm not sorry to disturb you. I said, I need something more to do. I said, I can play the piano for you. Um, why don't you let me play all your piano parts for you? Because she was playing all the piano. Basically, she was doing everything. She was playing the piano, she was singing. And we were all just sitting around playing these ridiculous instruments. And, you know, it, it wasn't a place where anybody could shine. But I said, no, please just... Let me play the keyboards, I can play the keyboards. So when she wasn't looking, I swiped the, the manuscript off the keyboard, photocopied it, I took it home, and I learnt all the parts. So when I came in on Wednesday, I thought, she can't refuse me. I'll just say, I've spent all night learning the parts, let me play. So I did, I nagged her, nagged her the next morning, let me play, let me play, let me play. And she said, no, sit down with your butter dish and be quiet. And I, so I sat down, and I spent another day just pinging on this butter dish, going absolutely insane in my head. And then... I thought, I know, she doesn't want me to play the piano, maybe she'll let me sing and do the rounds. So I said, um, could I just help you organise the women to sing in rounds? And I said, you know, I have been a worship leader. I've done children's ministry for 15 years. I said, this is well within my comfort zone. I said, please let me do something because I'm dying a little slow death over there. And she just said, no, you can't, you need to sit down. So again, I swiped the manuscript, I photocopied it, and I went home that night and I learnt all the the parts. And so I came in on the Thursday, I can't, I can't remember which day of the week I'm on now, I think it's Thursday, I said, I've learned all the parts, please let me do something. No. Um, Friday morning, I was just desperate. I was thinking, I've done everything I can, God. I thought this was my week. This was my moment to shine. It's not happened. And, um, you know, I was, I was literally waiting for the whole year for this week, and my hopes had been dashed, and I was very sad. So I got in the car, drove to uni on the Friday, and this was the day we were going to go to the school and perform this amazing assembly, but basically we were all just going to sit with the kids and watch our lecturer play and sing on our own. But this was the day we were going, and uh, <laughs> I just remember driving, going, God... Will you do something? Will you just help me for a minute? Because I wanted to shine this week. I wanted my moment in the sun. <laughs> I wanted all my friends to see what I could do. And I said, this is not what I envisaged. And there was one moment where I was so passionate in my prayer, I actually, I actually rolled down the window and I shouted out the window, God, let me shine! <laughs> and there were lots of passers-by. I got a bit of a shock that morning. I thought, oh my goodness, I did not realise the passion that I felt about this particular scenario. Got to university, I parked really badly because I thought I was going to move the car very quickly because we were all going off to the school. So I parked badly, ran into the lecture hall, met all my friends, we picked up all our junk instruments, <laughs> took them to the car, went to the school, arrived there. Lecturer didn't turn up. We were watching our clocks, where is she? The time rolled, she's not arrived, she's not arrived. Suddenly, we had to start. And um, we were all looking around, and, and all the girls were clacking, uh, clucking around me again, because it was all, all ladies in early years. Actually, there was one guy, but he was the biggest clucker of all, I've got to say. It was like... <laughs> so we're all panicking, rushing around, going, Woo, what are we going to do? The lecture starts. She was doing everything, we were doing nothing. It's all going to go horribly wrong. And then I suddenly realised, I thought, oh my goodness, she's not here. We have to start. I think that God has answered my prayers. And literally, my little heart was racing, and I was like wanting to run around going, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is happening. And I said, ladies, don't worry, because I am going to do the assembly. <laughs> and I ran up onto the stage, got the keyboard, and you know, with all my confidence and gusto, I was amazing, honestly. I'm, I'm sorry to say it, I was incredible. What was so... What was so amazing is I'd learned all the parts and I was divvying out the parts. You're going to sing this part, you're going to sing that. My friends were so shocked to see me so brazen and courageous that they all rose to the occasion and they were amazing. I thought, some of you can actually sing, I never knew. So suddenly we had all the, and the kids felt, you know, they came, they got high on the energy and suddenly we had this whole room of kids singing in all different keys and parts and it was, it was amazing. And the head teacher came up to me at the end, she said, Kate, that was the most amazing assembly that I have ever seen. And as she was saying that, my lecturer walked in. And I was like... 
the, the, uh, the headmistress said, yeah, you, they've done you proud. They've done an amazing assembly. She said, that's the best we've ever seen. And my, my uh, lecturer looked shocked. She said, well, I was not expecting to hear that. And she said, Kate, I'm so grateful. She said, I cannot tell you how indebted I am to you that you've, you've taken over and you did such an amazing job. And I said, it's OK. It's OK. Just write me a great reference to help me get a job. That's all. But I said, no, it's OK. It's OK. And she said, you know what? I'm going to kill that person who's blocked me in at the university. I remember thinking, I can't breathe. Because <laughs> I knew exactly, I knew exactly what I'd done. So my friends just quickly, I said, you need to get me back very fast. I think we broke a number of speed records going back to the university, moving my car before my lecturer got back. And I just thought, God, I don't know whether to celebrate or to be absolutely in shock because you answered my prayer and I had no, you've got to, honestly, I'm telling you the truth, I had no idea that it was her car. I couldn't possibly have known that it was me blocking her in. How could I have known? I said, God, you actually use me to answer my own prayer, block my jolly lecture in and then take over the show. <laughs> Is this an okay prayer to pray? And I think it was. I think it was okay. God said, you did an amazing job. You all got to shine. He said, you prayed. You need to know that I was listening. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's true. I've got to be careful what I pray because God is listening and he will cause a lot of disruption around me if my prayers get answered in this way. But this is to illustrate the story that God is a loving father. He wants you and I to shine. It actually brings glory to him when we tell these kinds of stories. It brings glory to him when you do use your talents. They're God's talents. They're not yours. You're just putting them on to display so that everyone can celebrate God. That's what your talents are for. You know, when God answers those kind of prayers, he's answering it because he's approved of them. I was tenacious. I was shameless. I really was. I sh totally shameless, totally outrageous. But he did seem to answer that prayer. And I think that there's a lesson to learn here that God does not want us to be passive. We don't just sit back and just accept the status quo. In prayer, he wants us to wrestle. He wants us to be active, proactive. He wants us to be tenacious and go after things because it brings glory to him. And Jesus goes on and he says, you know, this is my toolkit for prayer. He says, the first thing you need to do, disciples, you need to ask. Everybody say, ask. ask. Okay, you need to ask because when you ask, you will receive. If you don't ask, you're not going to receive. You ask. The, the instructions that Jesus gives his disciples, they're almost like stages. And ask is like the teeny widdly first stage. You know, we're not passive anymore. We're starting to be active. But as the, we're, the most active we're getting at this stage is we're just asking. We're just using our mouth. Okay, God, I'm asking. Now, I had a friend in Metro the other week. And uh, he said to me, he said, I've asked God to show me that he loves me and he's refusing to answer. And I said, I know God and I know he wouldn't refuse to answer a prayer like that. I said, can I ask you a question? How do you know that God hasn't answered that? I mean, how would you know when he has answered that prayer? And he looked at me and he said, I have no idea. So I said, you need a better prayer. I said, you need to be really specific. You need to ask God to do something specific to show you that he loves you. So a week later, he came back and he said, I followed your instructions. I asked God, I said, God, I feel a mess right now. I feel like an empty vessel poured out with nothing left to give. And I want to know that you know that about me. I want you to know, and I want to know that you know that. That's what I want. That's what my prayer is. And Literally a few hours later, he was in a meeting and there was some prayer happening. And somebody just said, I've got a word from God. And the word is that I know that you feel like an empty vessel poured out with nothing left to give. And literally she spoke the words verbatim at him. He was shocked. He was like, oh my goodness, God answered my prayer. He spoke back to me the exact same words that I spoke to him. 
Isn't that amazing? And that guy was just transformed. He said, I'm trying to explain to my work colleagues why I'm so happy this week, because I've heard God. He spoke to me and he's answered my prayer. So the first stage is we ask and we will receive. Second stage, it gets a little bit more pumped up, a little bit more energy. Okay, this one is seek. Everybody say seek. Seek. Okay, you seek. And Jesus says, and you will find. This is a little bit more kind of, this is like using your legs, isn't it? We're moving around. We're going places. We're we're not just asking with our mouths. We are going after something. We are seeking and in pursuit of something. And God says, if you're in pursuit of that, you're going to find it. You're going to find it. And um, do you know, the last sort of, I don't know, 15 years, I've sat with a lot of couples, married couples, who have been told that they won't be able to have children. And I always listen to that story and I'm thinking, do you know what, I just don't accept that. I want to seek a different reality for you. And I want to find that God will deliver for you. I want to find you in that place where you have got your child and you are a happy mother and a father. So there are lots of couples, you know, actually quite a lot of them have been in Metro, which is why we've lost our 30s, because they get married. Some of them had difficulties getting children, and Philip and I have prayed for them, and then they've got pregnant straight away. <laughs> and then they can't stay here because we have no provision for babies. But, you know, if you can think of any couples, I don't want to give any names away, but literally all of them, <laughs> all of them struggle to get pregnant. And I've got to be careful, because I, I got to them, oh, I said, my husband's great, he's got loads of women pregnant, and I mustn't say <laughs> that mustn't say that so we've seen miracles we've sought we've sought children for these couples and God has answered that prayer you know miraculously and then the last one is knock everybody say knock now knock is not a nice little God, are you there? (laughs) Open up. It's not that kind of knock. In the Greek word, it's a very forceful knock. It's actually like, um, uh, I've forgotten the word now. It's a um, battering ram. It's that kind of, that used in the the military where you ram against a gate and you keep ramming it, ramming it, ramming it, like a battering ram until the gate breaks. That is the word for knock. That is warfare. And God says, your prayer has got to be like that warfare because there are some things that are not going to budge when you ask. They're not going to budge when you seek. You actually have to go after them in a a kind of very military and a very, very aggressive way. Why? Because there are things that will oppose the kingdom of God in our world. You know, Philip was telling this story about the fall of Ceausescu. Um, and Romania, he was telling it to us on the weekend away, and how it came at the end of a massive prayer movement that was spearheaded by this incredibly brave man who led the country in peaceful prayer. But in their prayer life, they battered against the communist regime. They battered against it until it fell. A lot of things in our history have been moved out of the way. A lot of unjust regimes A lot of kind of violent and vicious rulers have been dismantled through the power of prayer. And it's that battering ram prayer. So it's those three types of prayer. So what does that mean for each one of us? What does it mean for our prayer life? Well, if you're passive in prayer, if you think that it just all happens, whatever God wants, it will happen, you know, what will be, will be. You need to move out of that passivity because it's not the story that Jesus tells. Jesus tells a story of a persistent nuisance neighbor who's just battering on that door of of his friend to get the bread. This is the story we need to get. And we need to be, the minimum, we need to be asking. We need to be asking God for things so that he can give us because he wants to give us and pour out gifts on his children. We need to be asking in our own personal devotions. We need to be praying on our own with God and cultivating that relationship of trust and cultivating. You know, when we pray with God, I was talking to the students at the weekend away. I said, you know, you need to, when you pray for God, you need to be specific. And some of you in the next few years, you might be praying for a husband or a wife. And I said, be specific about what you're looking for, because then you know 
when it's been answered, you can identify it. And while you're praying with God, you know, for weeks, for some, months, for others, years, for others, for me, it took three years of prayer before I found my husband. But I think in those three years, God was shaping my prayers because, you know, what I was requesting was, was not very rational. You know, I wanted Brad Pitt and, and God said, he's a divorcee, the alcoholic. I think you can do better than that. So, you know, when you're praying with God, he will then start to steer you. So you're praying a more rational prayer for yourself. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So if you're praying it, you know, he will kind of highlight, ur, 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 this is a bit of a crazy prayer and he'll let you know. So after a while, he's steering your prayers so that he can actually get you to the place where he wants you. We need to be praying more in our hubs and in our small groups and in our small communities. And we need to be doing some of that seeking prayer, just get a little bit more traction. And we need to be asking God for things which aren't possible. We need to be seeking out the supernatural and the impossible of God. And we need to be moving into that realm of that battering ram prayer. You know, we're going to be having a, a big prayer event in January where we want to do some battering ram praying because we know that there are obstacles in the city. There are things that are keeping people away from faith. There are keeping people in poverty. There, there, there are things that are keeping people in shame. They, there are people who are under demonic strongholds and we want to batter against those gates until they come down. We need to be interceding for the people in our city and the people in our world. And Jesus calls us to do that. He says, this is the picture I'm giving you. You need to be persistent. You need to battle. You need to keep going in prayer. Okay, have I fueled you up? Are you excited about prayer now? Yeah, do you want to ask for crazy things like I did? You know, let me shine. <laughs> you know, I'm, I think, I look back and I think, that's a bit of a narcissistic prayer, but I learned such a lot. I thought, God, God will answer prayers that he approves of. He won't answer the ones that are, you know, opposed to what he's about you know he wants to give us the things of the kingdom and they they look in in many different ways and they're all wonderful okay so we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up now and I'm gonna give you my big idea my big idea is we need to change our story about prayer from a passive one to an active one praying persistently and with shameless audacity gets results. One more time. We need to change our story about prayer from a passive one to an active one. Praying persistently and with shameless audacity gets results. And Father, I thank you that you've given us this incredible tool, this powerful gift in our hands, which is the gift of prayer. Lord, where we come together with you in collaboration. Lord, you wait for us to call down the blessings of God. You wait for us to call down the power of God. And Lord, you wait for us to call down those obstacles and those gates of the enemy that stand in our way. You, call, you, you expect us, Lord, to call down your power to remove those obstacles. And Lord, would you forgive us, Lord, where we've been passive in our prayer life, where we've just let things ride because we didn't believe enough, Lord. Our story was inadequate. We didn't know that you wanted us to be persistent, to keep going. Lord, forgive us. And Lord, would you equip each one of us now, tonight, with a new spirit. Lord, pull us into a new story. Lord, where we feel compelled to pray compelled to influence our world through prayer and see God's kingdom come here. In Jesus' name, amen.